having the fourth course on the school, in the school uh, on um, an advanced course on partial uh, business equations. I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Matt Mark Hannum of uh, Cardiff University. Thank you. Um, all right. Yeah. Thank you very much for asking me to uh, uh, to come here. It's been it's been uh, a great experience. Um, I'm not sure about how the experience next part will be for you, but we'll <laughs> we'll find out. Um, so yeah, this is uh, billed as advanced numerical uh, advanced partial differential equations or numerical methods. Uh, in, in reality, this is what I'm going to talk about is mainly, well, it's entirely uh, elliptic equations. Uh, and, well, in a moment I'll give you some motivation for why these are, are interesting in numerical relativity. So, it really, this is complementary to what um, Sasha talked about last week, where he, he focused on hyperbolic equations with evolution systems and there you. you your simple ex simplest example is something like the wave equation or the advection equation, and then this is acts as a uh, almost like a prototype to doing um, the the evolution for the Einstein equations. So here, if I, I guess I start here, if we do some bit of motivation, right? Composition. Right, you have you have a set of evolution equations for the metric uh, and the extrinsic curvature, and I won't write them out because they're very long and uh, and ugly. And, and and that's those are the equations that you would solve following on from what you did last week in the lab from um, Sasha's exercises. The difference with with Einstein's equations and also with electromagnetism. Uh, and I guess Thomas also talked about this, was that uh, the difference between that and something like the wave equation is that you can't just specify any data that you want. So you're, you start with some initial data of gamma and k, uh, and you of course also need some gauge conditions, and you, and you evolve, but you can't just choose anything. So in the wave equation, you can essentially put uh, pretty much any data you want, and then you, you, you evolve. Uh, for Einstein's equations and for... for Electromagnetism and, and many other theories, you also have to satisfy the data has to satisfy some constraints. So there are some restrictions on the data that you can uh, can specify, uh, and and these in, in the three plus one decomposition. You've already seen this. So I'll just write them out. Anyway, right? You have uh, you have the Hamiltonian constraint. Um, which is sort of obviously called the Hamiltonian constraint because it deals with the um, total mass energy of the system. And you have the momentum constraint, and this, this deals with the momentum. And so if you have, we have the momentum on the density on the right hand side. So you have to satisfy these. Um, so these are evolution equations, and these are constraints. Okay. And so before you do some, perform some 3 plus 1 evolution, you need data that satisfies the constraints. So the first job is to, is to solve these constraint equations. And in the form that they're written here, it's not especially obvious how to go about this for some particular system. If I say, I want... Um, my favorite example, I want to have, uh, solve Einstein's equations for two black holes in orbit. And you say, OK, I need to construct some data for two black holes. I'm going to solve these equations. Well, what do you, it's not obvious how to, how to do that, given these equations this way. So uh, if you perform this uh, conformal decomposition, which Thomas talked about, uh, where you um, You make some uh, conformal rescaling of the uh, the spatial metric, then you can rewrite the Hamiltonian constraint in a, in a different form. And uh, to make it even simpler, if I make extra some extra assumptions, 
just to, to simplify the form. If I, if I also have C, we assume informal flatness. All right, so this, this background metric, this conformal metric, just becomes the flat metric. You can imagine that makes things very much simpler. This also will then give you that uh, you'll get a, a conformal uh, Ricci scalar. This will also this will be zero. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. So in in uh, right in, in Cartesian coordinates, this is just one one one, right? Or in, or the appropriate flat metric for whichever coordinate system you you like. If you also impose maximal slicing, so you let trace of k be zero, and you can choose vacuum. Right. So you are clearly just killing off lots of things. Then you are left with the Hamiltonian constraint. Comes where um, I haven't defined this. This is a uh, conformal rescaling of the um, trace-free part of the, the extrinsic curvature. I think Thomas went went through this. This is essentially just review and motivation for, the, for what we want to do. So if you now look at this equation, this you now have a, a relatively simple looking elliptic equation. So you have this um, Laplacian operator and you have some, some source term. And this is what you, you solve for the, the Hamiltonian constraint. So the Hamiltonian constraint, and in, in fact, if you, if you go through this, uh, the, one of these decompositions, this conformal transverse traces decomposition, or the the uh, thin sandwich decomposition, or any of, of these flavors of uh, conformal decomposition, uh, you will also get elliptic equation uh, for the, the uh, momentum constraint. Um, and so then you'll have a set of elliptic equations that you have to solve in order to produce data which are valid, so valid, so valid data for Einstein's equations to then, then evolve. And so this is the motivation why uh, we want to solve equations. So from now until maybe Wednesday, I'm just going to talk about uh, very simple elliptic equations that uh, have essentially nothing to do with Einstein's equations. And then we'll look at examples in the lab um, or the exercise session or whatever we call it to um, you can practice the numerical methods of, of solving these. OK, so that's the, uh, the motivation for these uh, elliptic equations. The, um, oh, the other thing to, to mention here is that the if in, if producing obviously we're really in producing this we've made some assumptions so this is going to affect the uh, obviously the physics of our results um, if we're interested in uh, in physical systems that are not vacuum then of course this is, this is wrong so you've you've already made some assumptions and the other place where you put in assumptions is in the um, uh, is in the boundary conditions right so the, Right. And I think you will find when doing the numerical exercises that uh, the, numer the boundary conditions are, uh, shall we say, the most interesting part of uh, producing the solution. OK, so, so then let's look at a, a simple elliptic equation. So I should say the, plan, the basic plan for these lectures is that probably today and tomorrow I will talk about, uh, give examples of, different, of increasingly more complex kinds of elliptic equations and how you go about solving them. Uh, and then the second two days, I will talk about uh, particular examples from uh, black hole space time, so producing binary black hole initial data. Uh, and also some interesting example of the, uh, what can happen with the Schwarzschild solution. Uh, but the first two days are going to be just uh, 
elliptic equations. Okay, so we start with a uh, simple. Oh, I apologize for my handwriting. Uh, okay, so this is a simple one dimensional elliptic equation, is basically the, the simplest uh, example you could think of just to, to illustrate the, how we do things. So if we have some, some function. Something like this, okay, where we have a second derivative operator and some, some source term. And we consider it on the, um, on some domain, a simple domain. And let's even imagine that we have boundary conditions. So extremely simple boundary conditions. This, this function uh, exists between 0 and 1 for our purposes, and it's 0 at the, at the boundaries. So this is a, a very simple system. And in order to solve it, we do the same kind of things you did uh, when solving uh, hyperbolic equations, is that you, you take finite differences. Okay, so if we <coughs> consider trying to solve this by a finite difference method, we discretize uh, the domain. Domain, okay, so um, so now you so now our equation becomes u right, so we have some number of, of, of grid points. Um, I guess I can say that H is say we have let's say we have U's Endpoints. So H is in, and U um, work. Okay. All right. So now we can uh, discretize this this problem, and you already know how to write out the. Um, Sorry, not UI. I'm sorry. That's, sorry. XI. Right. Sorry. All right. So now if we finite difference uh, this, this equation, we already, you already know the second order finite difference uh, operator for a yeah, second derivative. So the equation becomes, uh, so now we have the All right, uh, and now we get this, uh, and then of course this way. Okay, so now if we can, if we uh, write this problem out, we can write this problem as a um, in a matrix form. Okay. Okay, so the Operator is we we won't worry right now what the it looks like near the the boundaries, but essentially the operator is going to look. You have a system of n equations, right? So you want to solve a system of n equations, and so you can write this um, this way. All right? And so now you have um, a matrix problem, right? And so if you so you can you can write this as Right? As a, I'm sorry? Ooh, 
Why? No, this is, so this is, I have, sorry, 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 I've got all this wrong, sorry. Right. Yeah. Or, or, what is that? sorry, yeah, I meant to, right. putting in a minus sign also fixes it, but yeah, I meant to write it this way, sorry. Yeah. So if you, if you look at this and you look at this operator, you can, I uh, should be able to pretty easily convince yourself that, you know, this is taking the uh, the element the yeah the element before and the element element after and and negative two times the the element that you you care about and so this is producing your system of equations for this um, for this problem, okay. And so in order to solve this, you have to 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 invert a matrix. But of course, first of all, you have to worry about the boundary condition. So I have, I have deliberately not drawn or not written in the elements at the corners here because these encode the boundary conditions. Okay. Okay. All right. So in this case, we have uh, extremely simple boundary conditions, um, which is nice because this makes a, a simple illustration. So um, if we have, and I've I've chosen deliberately uh, this this kind of grid where I've, uh, which is cell, it's called cell-centered grid. So. Um, In fact, I'm probably going to find out here I've numbered it incorrectly. Maybe not. Okay, so if we have some our domain from 0 to 1, we have our those points here, okay, then um, you know, this is dx, this is 2dx, etc. This is this point okay so what we can do here is we can uh, in our computational domain we don't need to include the boundary conditions because we have we have our boundary conditions uh, that the solution is zero at both ends these are our, our boundary conditions and it turns out that when we solve the system of equations we don't have to worry about uh, including the boundary in our system. so we actually use this as our Computational domain. Uh, right. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Right. So, um, right. So this is our. These points. Okay, and so I from uh, u1 to un minus 1. Okay, that's where we produce a solution. And u0 and un Right, so u0 Right, so the this is our, the particular boundary conditions that we've, uh, that we've chosen. Okay, so in order to, to work out how to impose these boundary conditions, we now uh, take a look at our, uh, our differential operator.
Okay, so we, if we take a look at, at um, the problem we want to solve, the differential operator at um, each boundary, so at, at x equals 0, right, so at this, at this end, right, if we consider the operator So you consider this operator for i equals 1, right? So this is for this, this point here, right? We're only calculating on these points. And so we say, okay, this is, the very this is the first one. This is the one at the very edge that we're, we're worried about. Because for this one, uh, in order to, to evaluate the operator, we consider the point ahead, which is this one, and that's fine. And the point behind, which is this one, but this is not in our, our domain. So now we... This is the one we have to think about it. So if we write down the operator for i equals 1. Right, that is our, our operator. And we know that the boundary condition is u naught zero. And so we have, so this operator then is just u, right? So this is our operator here. You don't look very happy. This is at, we're at, we're at point one here. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is what our, our operator looks like. So this is the only thing we want. It, okay. No. This is the only thing we want to, to evaluate. And so it turns out. So if we now look at our matrix, we want um, minus two times u one and one times u u two, and that's all. And so actually, this matrix. If we write this in the completely naive way, where we just repeat this and just have to throw away this one here at the end because there's no, no place for it, then we actually get the right, um, the right matrix. So for this particularly simple example, you can write down the most naive way of writing down this matrix and you will actually correctly impose uh, the boundary conditions. Assuming, of course, that you've, you're only considering these, these points. Okay? Okay. Um, All right, and and similar, the same thing happens similarly. All right. So if you if you can't see the bottom of the board, I just it's a, it's similarly at x equals one. If you do the, the same calculation at x equals one, you find exactly the same thing, and now you have minus two. Yeah, like this. Okay, so, so this is how you now, you've, you've constructed your matrix, uh, and, and this is now what you want to solve. Okay, okay. so as an example of, um, well, and so you will do an example of this in, um, in the lab, and the, um, the example is uh, right, and so the the, the um, lab exercises is to solve this equation. Um, with this kind of, of discretization, uh, with of course zero, and 
this one was chosen for well for various reasons. But one reason is that there's we can just write down the analytic solution. The analytic solution is uh, okay. So you can verify that you got the right answer when you solve it. Okay. So one. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll talk in a moment about uh, how to solve it. Uh, but one point that's to bear in mind is that, of course, if you've produced a solution numerically, what do you do to check that it's okay? The convergence test, all right. You've, you've trained them well, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Even, even for the, you say, this is such a stupidly simple problem. Uh, and I, I code it up in five minutes, and I've got the answer, and I look, and I plot this over top of the answer, and they look pretty close. I'm done. And I think, no, you have to check that it, it converges, right? So this, wherever I've written it, this is a second order accurate finite difference operator, so your solution should, uh, uh, as you double the resolution, the, the error should go down by a factor of four, and if it doesn't, then you've, you've made a mistake. And probably where you've made a mistake is in the boundary conditions, which in, in this example be, would be quite depressing. Um, but that, you absolutely have to check that. Now, one thing that's, there's two things that are very nice about this, that, this example. One is the boundary conditions are, uh, are rather trivial. The other is that if I want to perform a convergence test, then, of course, I, the simplest thing is to double the grid resolution. And if I double the grid resolution, then I have to actually take differences uh, with all the points lining up, right? So if I have a convergence test, right? Okay, I have my, my grid, 0, 1, and I have h, 2h, Etc. Okay, I remember to call them H's this time. And now, of course, the next, so this is my H equals 1. Okay. Right, and so now I uh, double the number of points, and so I have uh, H minus 2. If I double the number of grid points, can I make my new grid? Then I'm very happy because, uh, well, hopefully I don't have to check convergence at here because this is, this is set identically, hopefully. Uh, but these points, of course, just line up. So that's, that's very nice. And you can very easily take the differences and check that you have, you have convergence. OK. All right. But now imagine you have a different boundary condition. Uh, imagine instead you have uh, a Neumann boundary condition. Okay. Right. So you, you prime. Right. Some say that at the. At the um, Leftmost boundary, you want the derivative to be, be some value. Okay? And so now you, this is a bit tricky with this kind of, of setup because this, this point's not, it's not on your domain. Uh, and so I mean, there are various ways of imposing these conditions, but sometimes the easiest way to do this is to now use instead a staggered grid. Now. Okay, so now is zero. But now your first point is at h over two, and your next point is at three h over two. 
And the last point is it right here, and then the boundary is it. Okay, so so now you have all these points which are lined up like this, and. Uh, but they're staggered, and so now what you will do is you will assume the existence of some other point out here, which will allow you to, to impose your your boundary condition. Okay, so now if we could. Okay. Um, Right, so now, so, so now if we, if we go back to this point, the i equals, right, this is, I don't know, i equals 1, 2, so on. Okay. Now the, um, take this operator again, you can again get u, um, squared, right, this is your problem that you want to solve. And so to impose the boundary condition, you require that you, you want that the derivative um, is zero here, okay? Sorry? What have we done? What? Ah, oh, sorry. So I see. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> was that that was your problem? No, you look like uh, you. So you try to be uh, a a and not zero. Right. Oh, sorry. Right. So yeah, you want to set it to to. Sorry, did I say zero somewhere in there? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You want the, the derivative to be a, not zero. So, yeah. Okay. And and you want it to be a at x x equals zero. Okay. So. So you prime of zero, you just write you finite difference this, you write this as right, this is what you require if you finite difference. If this is the finite difference equation for this. Uh, no, this is because this is centered. This is okay. Yeah, yeah, right. This is this is why I want to set it up this way so I could have the centered derivative. Yeah. Okay, so this can be rewritten as, in terms of our, our grid setup, is this is u at point 1, and this is u at, at point 0, or, or you know, index 0, um, that's, that's not in our domain, right? This h over 2 is, is i equal 1, and this is i equals zero here, right? So I have u one minus u zero a. So I have that. Okay. So I I now know because from my boundary condition I know what u zero is. So u zero is not in my. I don't. This is not. Um, part of the, the set of equations that I'm going to solve, uh, but I need to know what it is, but I know it from the boundary condition, so I don't have to include it. So if I now write my, my operator, I have, uh, where have I written it down? Over here, 
Okay, now, now for, for you naught, I've got... Everyone... I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry? It's minus H. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. It's completely wrong. So this is uh, U, right. So U, uh, yeah, U, sorry, right. Is that right? Yes. Right. Sorry. Okay. Yep. Sorry, yeah, that's not very. Uh -huh. This is i equals one. Right. So this this is the this is my boundary here at x equals zero. This is x, right? But this is not on the there's no grid point there. Right? There's a grid point over here at h over two, and there's a sort of fake imaginary grid point over here at minus h over two, but there is nothing at at the origin. Okay? So so I don't, I don't do a calculation over here, but even if I did do a calculation at i point zero, it wouldn't be on the boundary. Uh, so by this to h. Yes. Yes. So this, is, this point is at h over 2, and this is h over 2 plus h, 3h over 2. Uh, the two points that exist on my grid. Right? Um, yeah. Right, I can, th this is, I've sort of written this out independently. This is just a, okay. All right, are there any other mistakes so far? No? Okay, all right. <clears throat> I could pretend that I've made the mistakes intentionally, but I haven't, I, <laughs> I just made the mistakes. So, um, okay. Uh, right, so now I take my, my you, you want, Two plus u naught plus two. Right, this is my operator. And now for u naught, I substitute in in this one. And so I get u two squared. Uh, right. Is that correct? Right. Yes? Okay. Okay. So now, um, Uh, so then at, at this point, right, right, so now this this piece becomes part of my, uh, my right-hand side. Now you, right? So th this is the operator, right? But if I now ri just write out the, the, differential, the differential equation that I want to solve at the point, at the, the first index, then, then it's of this form. So now I have this, this change to the operator that I'm solving. So this is going to change um, uh, the matrix. And also, I get a, a little piece on the, the right-hand side here. Okay. So now, um, okay. So the first rows of the matrix problem are then 
integral 1 over h squared. So now, right, we don't have minus, uh, yeah, minus 2 here. We have just minus 1. So now the matrix on the first line is, is 1, like this. And then after that, it continues. As, as before, uh, so it looks like this plus. This is the small. Uh, a vector over here which has just this this one lone entry which is the boundary condition term yeah well at the, at the last point well I haven't got to the last point yet the last point the, the last point uh, I'm going to keep my old boundary condition because that's going to have changed now because I have a staggered grid right so this is just the first that's why I'm just saying the first few rows look like this okay so so there's this basic form of the, this operator, which repeats all through. And then there's a small change to the first row. And you also get a, a, a term over here. OK? So you're writing this in this matrix form to do some stability analysis? Uh, I'm just writing this just because, it's, uh, because when we solve, we're going to be thinking in terms of solving a matrix problem. And so, um, and so the, qu the question then always with an elliptic problem is, it comes down to inverting a matrix, right? Um, and, and that's essentially where your, your numerical problem comes in because if... So for this problem, uh, it's going to turn out to be essentially very uh, simple to solve this. Uh, but if I have a... Uh, I mean, this matrix... I'll get onto this in a minute. Okay. So, yeah. You're just asking why do you have to keep writing these... drawing these matrices, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, obviously, in practice, in a code, you're not going to construct a vector which has this one little, you know, follow in here. That's kind of a waste of time. Yeah. Okay. So just, just for completeness now, we look at the right boundary, which is perfect because this was the right boundary, and now it's awesome. Grid. At the, uh, do I have a picture? Right. So now when I do the, the right-hand boundary, which is still, let's just say it's still the same boundary condition as before. It's just zero there. I want this to be zero. It's now no longer good enough to just leave the uh, operator unchanged because the next grid point that you're sort of implicitly treating in a certain way is not the boundary. It's, 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 it's overshot. So you have to do something slightly different. So now, whoops. Okay, here now, um, so to impose this, uh, the easiest way to do it, one way to do this is to require. Um, Right. So what you do is you say that you want u. So u one is one. Zero. Right. So you, you don't have a point at. There is no grid point here. Right. So you can't impose a boundary condition at that point. But you do have a, uh, and you have a ghost point or a, or a fake point here. Sorry. Over here. So you have these two points. And so in order to require that this has the value of 0, you, 
you can ask that the average be zero. Okay, so this is the same. Okay, in other words, you. This is your, your boundary condition. Right? So you know, you know that the, in, or, in order to require that the average is zero, you said that uh, you know, these two must be equal and opposite. Okay. So, um, so again, we plug into our, our equation. So at So i equals n minus 1, which is our last, last point on our, our domain. Um, we now have OK, and then for this point, we just substitute in the negative of un minus 1, so we get okay, so now we get this, the operator looks like this, and so now the last part of our matrix um, Look at the last part of the matrix. It's now <coughs> etc. Right? So you've just changed these. This very last problem. Okay. So, so implementing um, the, uh, the system is just a case of it's all, it's all very straightforward until you just have to deal carefully with, with the boundaries. Um, and so if you, you can now imagine now what happens if you have clearly you can have a, um, a Dirichlet boundary condition where it's not zero at the boundary, it's some value B and then you just do the same thing here. We just put B here and, and solve, and you'll again have um, some extra term uh, in the in the source. And so now, and and you can now imagine, of course, mixed boundary conditions where you have some mixture of derivatives and, and values that uh, are are in there, and you can just by these two tricks calculate what the how to impose um, the boundary condition. All right. So I'll. This actually is a good place to take a break. The thing to mention, of course, is that uh, the reason I, I commented on convergence previously was in the, in the nice self-centered grid, convergence is trivial. For a staggered grid, now life is harder because when you now double the grid resolution, your, your first point is going to be here, and your next point is going to be here, and they're not all going to line up. Right, between, between resolutions. And so if you want to do the convergence test, then you have to use some interpolation method to get the values um, at, at the same at the points that line up. Um, and of course, you have to make sure you use an interpolation method uh, that's at a higher order than the convergence you want to see. If you use first order interpolation, then I think you'll probably find that your solution is first order um, convergent. And in fact, if you just naively take the second points, every second point as before, then you will see, again, first order convergence because the difference between, between these points and the ones that line up is a, is a first order error. Okay. So when doing the convergence test with this, if you do th the naive thing, you will, um, you will just see first order convergence. All right, let's stop for a few minutes. Okay. Shall we start again? Okay, let's... Uh, begin again. Uh, all right. Okay.
Okay, so now we, we've set up these problems as, as matrix problems. And so, so our problem now looks, you know, we want to solve something like this, right? Some matrix problem like this, where clearly the solution is, is this, this thing, right? So if we, if we knew the inverse of this matrix, then we will be done. And if someone gave us the inverse of the matrix, we just apply it to our, um, our right-hand side, and we have the solution, okay? Uh, and in general, this is, this is the general problem with solving uh, elliptic equations, is that you may have a very, very large matrix to invert. So if you say, well, I, I really want to get a very accurate solution here, so I really want 1,000 grid points, well, you've now constructed a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, and you don't want to by hand calculate uh, the inverse of this, right? If you use uh, this Kramer's rule for calculating the inverse of a matrix, this is a in factorial operation. Um, that's not a very efficient way of solving the problem, especially in the, in the example case where we, we knew the analytic solution. Um, so in, well, in this particular example, it would turn out that because this, this uh, if, if our matrix, I don't have a, here's an example of matrix, right? If this matrix was, com was completely diagonal, right, then of course we could just read off the solution. This would be trivial, right? Uh, and in fact, it's almost diagonal, right? It, it's, it's, it's just got these extra elements either side of the diagonal. Uh, and this is what's it's called a tri-diagonal matrix. And it turns out that it, for a tri-diagonal matrix, it's, um, if you want to do the, you know, if you, if you have a matrix, you can invert it, of course, by Gaussian elimination, which should also be, uh, relatively slow, but for this, that you can, if you apply Gaussian elimination, you can just write down uh, a very simple method to go through and quickly um, and quickly solve this. So, in in this case, there'll be an easy easy method which I'll, I'll um, uh, tell you about. In larger problems, in particular, once you go to, to higher dimensions, you then know, lose this even for a. Um, uh, a Laplace-like equation, if you go to higher dimensions, you will now lose this tri-diagonal structure to your matrix. You will end up with these band matrices, and you cannot use this, this method. Um, and so then you can use, uh, there are various, so one of the main techniques of doing this is then you can use relaxation methods where you, you produce an iterative solution, uh, and with each iteration, your solution gets closer and closer to the correct one, and then you stop when you're, uh, you read some tolerance. That you can also use multi-grid methods, which uh, essentially reduce the problem down uh, to a small enough grid where you can trivially invert the matrix, and then you work your way back up. Um, you sort of bounce up and down through these these, these hierarchies of of grids. Um, and I will talk a little bit about those problems later. But for for now, we can talk about the the simple um, uh, tridiagonal um, system. So, if you have a, um, so we have a, we have a tridiagonal system. Matrix. So you have something of this form. Wait, you have you. Right, this is your, your system. All right. So if you were to apply um, Gaussian elimination to this, right, I... I guess everyone probably remembers how Gaussian elimination works, right? First, you 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 know you can divide, you can you can scale the rows as you wish, and you can um, subtract multiples of, of rows from each other. So you first divide this row by b1, um, and then so you one, right? Divide. And then you would uh, Subtract uh, 
right? So you perform, you do that, and then you will. Um, so you then have one. So um, okay, and if you I'm assuming I've got this right. Uh, looks okay to me, yes, yeah. All right, and so you can see that you can then repeat this process uh, to get uh, an, a, a system which is in, in this uh, of simple upper diagonal form, right? And so then the algorithm uh, is that So I hear there's a murmuring, which usually means I've made a mistake. No? Okay. All right. Um, right. I mean, the chances of making a mistake and writing this down are basically 100%. So, <laughs> so yeah. So if it, but the chances of er if everyone follows along and works it out, of everyone getting it wrong are less than 100%. Okay. Okay, so this is what a update. Um, so if you if you look at what I did here, you can you can see this is this is consistent, and then you also have to operate. Sorry, I've called these D's here. Whoops, that's one mistake. Okay. Oh, there must be a... I feel like there must be a prime somewhere in here. Um. Okay, all right. So this is the algorithm. So you go through this algorithm and... The end. Yes. I'm sorry. What? Uh, in the part. Yep. Uh, well, well, no, because I'm going to. Um, because in the next step, I'm now going to divide through here by this to make this one, right? So I've, I've done one step, and at the next step, I'm going to divide again by this to get um, a one here. And so then this will change. So, the, so ultimately, this one will be divided by this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so which line are we looking at this? Yeah. Okay, it's. So f2 prime is f2 minus 
F1 uh, prime times, yeah. So yeah, so there's a prime here and there's a prime here. And those are the only primes. Okay. Okay. All right, so once you've gone through this process, um, you will get, all right, you now have a matrix uh, which is of this form. all the way down to right so you have this and yes How do the diagonals become? <coughs> uh, because in so in the first so I just did the first step, right? So the first you divide at the beginning of each step you divide by um, the row by the value of the di in the diagonal, so that becomes one, and then you operate with with that. Okay, all right. It's, this is one of these algorithms which you just have a matrix of numbers. It's it's not that hard to do. It's just it's hard to write down the, the algorithm, right? Okay, but uh, you've got your algorithm. You, you run through all of your thousand points with this. You end up with a matrix like this. And now you can see that you can just um, solve by back substitution. Right. So un... F in prime, and then if in general UI is F I prime minus C I <coughs> right. I'm sorry? Yep. The, 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 sorry, yeah, that prime. Yeah, yeah, okay, that should be in. I must have, right, that's just up. Sir, but we already know the value in the boundary. Hmm? We already know the value at the boundary. So, so here, oh, well, here I've just, I've written this just down for, for a matrix that's in, an in by in matrix. Okay, so this is not, you know, you don't have to think of the, the previous problem where we had zero and in, and this is, the, the numbering is, um, Change. This is, I mean, this is of course, obviously, this is a, a general method. If you have a, if you happen to come across a tridiagonal matrix, this is the method to solve it. So it doesn't, it has no, uh, doesn't necessarily have any connection whatsoever to solving an elliptic problem. It's just, sol it's just solving a system of equations or, of any system of equations or solving a, inverting a matrix. Okay. So you now, given this, you can just read off uh, the solution. So you, so in in a code. You basically make one sweep through uh, the matrix, performing all these uh, these substitutions, and then you basically sweep back in reverse, reading off the solution. And then, so then, in, in some other two passes through, uh, um, essentially two n steps, you have inverted the matrix. Right. So for for an n squared matrix, that's that's pretty good. Right. Um, Okay. So how do you get this? So here, for in each, um, on each line, I have you know, one times, you, you, you know, one times U I uh, plus C uh, C times U i plus 1, right? And I already have I, ui plus 1, so I can solve that equation. Okay? So each, each line 
gives ui plus ci prime ui plus 1 equals if i prime, right? That's what, if I, if I just, if I expand this back out into a set of equations, I'll just have a, a whole set of equations that look like this. Um, but since I'm working backwards from, from n, I, I can, the, the very first one is just un is fn prime. So then for, the, for n minus 1, I can now say un minus 1 plus c prime of n minus 1 is, uh, is plus un is this. And then I can solve this for, for un. Okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm just working backwards. Um, I mean, if, if this is not completely clear, the easiest way is to write out a very small matrix, not a big matrix, <laughs> and basically just go through the procedure and, and you'll see that it's, um, it's much clearer uh, than writing out all of these A's and B's and C's and things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions? So that, that, yeah, oh, you have a question? Yeah. What is the more efficient if I convert it into a quadratic expression and solve for an external question? You turn it into a quadratic Sorry? Yeah, well, how would you find the minimum? So, well, I'm not sure what you mean by turning it into a quadratic equation. I mean, all of these are, this is a system of linear equations. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, this is, a, this, is just a, this is a standard method for solving a system of linear equations where you happen to have the very fortunate form that you only have off diagonal elements in your your matrix, so you can perform this. I mean, in general, right? If this was a, this matrix was completely full, so for example, if I used a spectral method to solve the uh, equation, then I would I would have a completely full matrix, and then uh, yeah, then it's it's much more expensive to solve. So then then this Gaussian elimination method is is much slower. Okay. So one other one uh, caveat of this method is that you can see you're all the time dividing by these things which are differences something, right? So if somewhere along the line one of these things becomes zero, then the method will fail, okay? So, of course, to, in order to get such a s solution, you need a matrix with an inverse, so you need a non, uh, an invertible matrix. But even if the matrix is invertible, it, could, it can happen that one of these intermediate steps, uh, one of these intermediate pieces is zero, uh, and then you, the method blows up, okay? And so, in practice, there are more sophisticated tricks where you, uh, you also rearrange rows. Hmm? We use pivoting with zeros and varieties and things. So you use pivoting, you see? Yeah, what? Yeah, right. Right, so this is what you do in, in practice is you... you rearrange these rows in order to get this to not work. And the other th thing that, that that saves is that it's not just if these things go to zero, but of course if they become close to zero, then you may have uh, round off problems in your calculation and, and get very large errors. Um, in, in the system that, that you're going to solve, this is not going to be a, a problem. But it's, it's worth bearing in mind that this method, uh, when it's applied naively, can, can simply fail if, if this happens. All right, so that's the uh, system. So I have only 15 uh, minutes left. So, well, what I was going to talk about next, I guess, is a bit longer, but I guess I'll just start and make some progress. Are there any other questions about this method? Okay, this is the method that you will implement in the um, in the lab to solve this um, this simple elliptic equation system or um, the constraint equations. So let's consider a Okay, so I have this system. I now have a very similar equation, but now I consider it in, in spherical coordinates. Okay? So in particular, let's this is a pretty bad F. 
Okay, so for, as an example, let's consider, um, we can write this out. In, if we assume we have a spherically symmetric solution, then this is the only part of the Laplacian that we, we care about. And I'm going to consider the following um, example. Okay. And you might ask, why did I make up this crazy looking example? Well, this is, bears some resemblance to the kind of, kind of uh, setup that we have when we solve the, um, the Hamiltonian constraint, in a way. Okay? Uh, and we require So we have a number of, so the life has got a little bit more complicated now. Now we have a more complicated uh, differential operator. And it turns out that we can actually treat this in two different ways. Right? So we can, um, we can rewrite this. Uh, as right we can rewrite it like this and then we finite difference phi double prime just as we did before or and phi prime this is the, or, uh, straightforward um, and solve the system. The other way we can do it, which is in a way is more, more symmetric, is that we can actually finite difference this piece individually. So we can actually take a, calculate the finite difference derivative uh, of, you know, for, of phi. And then given that, we can then calculate the finite difference derivative of r squared phi prime. And this turns out to give uh, a slightly more symmetric form, um, which in, in practice can be can be useful. Actually, for the example, for this example, uh, I tried both. It doesn't really make that much, much difference. But it is, it's, it's useful to know that you can do it um, either way. Okay. Okay. All right, so then what is, is useful to do for this kind of, of problem is to actually, before just going and saying, okay, now I'm going to start finite differencing away, is to actually think about what kind of, uh, some of the properties of the, the solution. In particular, if you have a Laplacian like this, you know that one of the, the valid solutions of the Laplacian uh, is, is 1 over R, okay? And so if your solution is going to have something that looks like 1 over R, uh, that's, that's going to be problematic when you, you do your solution um, and you solve the thing numerically. And you may want to take, do things to, tricks to take into account that kind of thing. So, uh, for example, you may rescale the solution by R in, you know, in order to get a more well-behaved um, solution. So we want to know if this, this, the, the properties of this solution. Okay. So let's look at... Okay, so uh, assume that phi, the phi, phi behaves as some power of r, okay, as r to the n, okay? So, um, If we go towards r equals zero to the origin, right? Uh, sorry, before I say that, okay. If the so if the solution behaves as r to the n, um, then then the Laplacian will behave as r to the n minus two. And right? if you just plug this 
into to the Laplacian operator, uh, you, you'll see that you get out something which goes out of the n minus 2. And so as we look at uh, the limit towards the origin, as we go towards r equals 0, uh, then the right-hand side, right, this, the source term, right, as we go to the origin, this, this goes r goes to 0, so this denominator goes towards 1, and the numerator goes to 0 as r squared, so the right-hand side behaves as r squared. And for consistency, then, um, so so we require that n must be 4, right? Because the operator acting on, on phi gives you something r to the n minus 2. r to the n minus 2 has to be r squared, so it must be 4. So, um, so near the origin, phi must be some constant. Well, okay. So we already have by just because of the the properties of the um, the source term here. Uh, we we yeah we see that this thing is 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 fine. Okay. Now of course we could still have. Uh, a 1 over r in the solution because the 1 over r is eliminated by this operator. Right? I'm sorry? That's at the other end, at infinity. Yeah. We're looking at the, the origin here. Yeah. So at the origin. Right? So, um, but numerically, um, we, well, we know that there's always a 1 over r piece which is somehow undetermined, but we. Um, we know that the, the, the rest must behave like this. So we have, so we know something about the behavior of the solution near the um, near the origin. Okay. What is the? Do I have time to go through this? <coughs> okay. Yeah. So then there is an argument about what happens uh, at large r. But I think I'll leave that till next time because there's uh, a number of steps involved there. I think it would be foolish to stop halfway through that. Um, so this is, this is the right time to stop, right? Yeah, okay. So I'm confused. All right, okay. Thank you.